Hello, listeners. As an enhancement to your listening experience, I am now going to present these archive episodes unedited in their entirety, which includes all of my afterthoughts. So, continue listening after the outro music if you want to hear what I thought of the episode. And if you are enjoying the podcast, please support it by going to the homepage spacerockethistory.com and clicking on the orange donate button or the Patreon link. And now I can also accept Zelle and Venmo. Just use my email address, spacerockethistory at gmail.com. Thanks. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Godspeed, John Glenn. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Can I feel out? Okay, I'm out. How does it feel for the United States to be the new record holder? At last, huh? Well, in that baby light, there's no doubt about it. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Houston, uh... Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Hello and welcome. This is Michael Annis, and you're listening to episode 258 of the Space Rocket History Podcast. And now, Apollo 13 Introduction. 1969 had been a great year for mission control in Houston. They completed four tough missions, the first lunar landing and the near disaster of the Apollo 12 lightning strike. A year of world-class performance under pressure and a perfect track record. It was time to celebrate. After the long and irregular hours, the controllers were at a disadvantage when it came to the splashdown parties after the Apollo missions. After the congratulatory handshake and puffing the traditional cigar, they secured their mission control consoles and called their wives. Exhausted by the demands of the mission, but still excited by the adrenaline rush that comes from getting another crew home safely. To relieve some tension, just about everyone attended the splashdown parties after the Apollo missions. The controller's splashdown party normally started at the officers' club at Ellington Air Force Base, about a 10-minute drive from the Mission Control Center. Occasionally, the Air Force Reserve Squadron would fly up to Maine for crew navigation training purposes, stopping long enough to get a bunch of live lobsters and have them cooked and waiting for the splashdown party. After finishing at Ellington, the controllers moved to either the Singing Wheel or the Flintlock, both located in the small city of Webster, about a three-minute drive from the Mission Control Center. In addition to splashdown parties, Mission Control personnel held debriefing parties. In contrast with the splashdown parties, the debriefing parties were a more private gathering restricted to crews and controllers. The Hoff Brow Garden in Dickinson, Texas, 10 miles south of the control center, was the rally point. The remote location got the controllers away from the crowd and the Galveston County Sheriff's Department often looked the other way. The restaurant had a large open-air beer garden, a bakery, and a butcher shop. Now, the formal mission to breathings were not for the thin-skinned, so a few liters of beer softened the edge as they cooked sausages, drank, and continued into the informal debriefing. The focus of the debriefing party was to award the dumb S-word medals, also known as DSM. During the course of the mission, flight directors, controllers, and crew compiled a list of errors, both perceived and actual. 
In an elaborate and highly graphic fashion, the controllers stepped forward to make a speech or accept an honor. The Hofbrau Garden's Umpha Band often joined in, playing a dirge as the stories got longer and wilder. The award took many forms. Elaborate certificates, dented and broken equipment, photographs, and multicolored ribbons to be worn around the neck. By the end of the Jiminy program, Gene Krantz had enough awards that the controllers presented him a set formatted like the bars of military campaign ribbons. One of the highest order dumb S-word medals passed out at the debriefing party was for anyone who missed a pre-sleep checklist item and then had to wake the crew to correct a switch position or pump up the pressures in the tanks. Gene Krantz's awards ranged from triggering a fire alarm during a mission when he emptied his ashtray into the waste basket to locking the control room doors for launch before all his team members had returned to the room. A common DSM among the flight directors was awarded for leaving the console log behind at the press conference or for a poor selection of crew wake-up music. Moving on to the 1970s. The new decade opened with a nation polarized by the war in Vietnam and a space agency unsure of its future. After a year of triumph, NASA faced a combination of public apathy and outright hostility for costly, high-tech government so-called boondoggles like putting men on the moon. At the same time, NASA's leaders were on uncertain footing with the Nixon White House, already faced with the leanest NASA budget in nine years. Administrator Thomas Paine had suspended production of the Saturn V, leaving enough boosters to fly missions through Apollo 20. But Apollo Applications, the project to launch a temporary space station made from Apollo's spare parts, was already going ahead, and now it became clear that a Saturn V would be needed to launch the station into Earth orbit. So, in January 1970, Payne canceled Apollo 20, and before long, there were signs that two more Apollo flights were in jeopardy. Meanwhile, preparations went ahead for Apollo 13, set for a spring 1970 launch. But within NASA, the question was raised, was it time to abandon the moon? In recent days, none other than the Manned Space Center's director, Bob Gilruth, had privately called for an end to the moon landing program. Some considered Gilruth the father of manned spaceflight. Perhaps no single person had done more to make Apollo a reality and no one had higher regard for the astronauts. To them, too, he had always been something of a father figure. Gilruth had sweated every new mission, even more than most of the safety-conscious NASA managers. But he had always been willing to take the risk, provided they were worthwhile. But there were new challenges and new programs on the horizon. With two lunar landings accomplished, Gilruth questioned if it was wise to risk men's lives and NASA's future again and again. Gilruth wasn't at all sure that it was wise. In fact, he wanted to stop at Apollo 12 before they lost an astronaut. NASA was a democratic organization in which such opinions were freely expressed, but Gilruth's entreaties did not change the course of Apollo. Everyone knew how risky a venture it was, 
and sometimes it seemed as though they were tempting fate with each new mission. And no one realized this more than the astronauts. Any of them, if asked, would have said it was just a matter of time before some hidden flaw in the system, some unnoticed mistake that the quality control checks hadn't caught, would come around to bite them. Spaceflight had always been a game of probability, but the crew of Apollo 13 had no reason to suspect that the odds would finally turn against them. Lunar exploration began in earnest after the pinpoint landing of Apollo 12. As NASA envisioned it, the Apollo 13 mission was going to be one long, difficult experience. Apollo 11 and 12 were targeted to touch down in two of the moon's friendliest spots, the Sea of Tranquility and the Ocean of Storms. While such desert flat plains make hospitable runways, to a geologist they are not very interesting. Those targets were essentially miles and miles of rocks and dust, all made of roughly the same material and all roughly the same age. Mission targeting now moved to more difficult and hazardous landing areas. The lunar hills held promise for its sighting geological samples. So different was the geological makeup of the moon's highlands from that of its lowlands that the higher ground even reflected sunlight more brightly, offering a shimmering come-hither beacon to explorers staring up from Earth. On Apollo 13, NASA planned to answer the call. Targeted for touchdown on the third lunar landing was a place known as the Frau Moro Range, a stretch of rugged Appalachian-type mounds 110 miles east of the Apollo 12 landing site. The targeted landing site itself was 3,000 feet in diameter, located north of the Frau Moro Crater. The crater was located in a geologic formation known as the Imbrium Basin. Scientists believe the basin, one of the largest on the moon, was formed by a gigantic cosmic collision. Scientists hoped that samples of this material ejected during the collision would establish the date of the Imbrium event. Additionally, the job of reconnoitering the site and finding a safe touchdown spot would provide a valuable test of both the skills of the astronauts and the maneuverability of the lunar module. More harrowing than Apollo 13's destination was the route the spacecraft would take to get there. On previous lunar missions, the crews had flown to the moon on the free return trajectory that would guarantee them an automatic trip home in the event that their service module engine failed. On Apollo 13, this would not be possible. While the terrain of Frau Morrow made the landing site a perilous one, the lunar lighting at that time of day the crew was scheduled to arrive would make it even more perilous. The flight plan called for the ship to get to the moon when the sun was at such an angle that the telltale shadows, Frau Morrow's boulders and hills would ordinarily cast would not be there. Without shadows, these topographical obstacles would be far harder for the astronauts to see. Changing the ship's trajectory so the crew would arrive when the shadows were longer would be a simple matter, requiring only a quick engine burn on the outward coast to the moon. But once the engine was fired, the spacecraft would no longer be on the free return trajectory. If Apollo 13 failed to go into orbit around the moon, the new trajectory would still whip it around the direction of Earth, but cause it to miss the home world by some 40,000 miles. <laughs>
which brings us to training for Apollo 13. To train for such a risky mission, both the crew and the mission control team that would support them put in almost unheard of hours. At mission control, Gene Krantz was the lead flight director for Apollo 13. The other flight directors were Griffin, Windler, and Lunny. Lunny was the last of the original flight dynamics officers, the master of his craft. The Apollo 13 flight director chemistry was unique. Windler and Krantz were jet fighter pilots, while Griffin flew as a radar operator. For the first time, they were all working together on a mission. Of course, the preferred method of training was to run flight simulations. During a typical simulation, the control room was set up exactly as it would be if a real flight was taking place. The consoles were fully staffed, their screens full of data, their headsets full of chatter, tracking screens at the front of the room were lit and flashing. The only difference was that all of the signals would come not from space, but from a double row of consoles behind a glass wall on the right side of the main control room. This was where the simulation supervisors sat. Their job was to run artificial flights and give controllers simulated problems to see how fast they could come up with solutions. A controller's performance in these pretend situations could have a very real bearing on their future at NASA. One afternoon, a few weeks before the launch of Apollo 13, Cy Liebergott and the rest of the controllers were at their consoles monitoring routine data from a routine phase of a so far routine simulation. The sim being run was known as a fully integrated one. This meant that while the mission was a sham and the spaceship was a sham, the astronauts involved were the genuine articles. Nearby on the Manned Space Center compound was the crew training building, equipped with working mock-ups of both the command and lunar modules. In residence today were Lovell, the commander of the mission, Mattingly, the command module pilot, and Hayes, the lunar module pilot. As on all simulations, as well as on the flight itself, the controllers could hear all the banter between the astronauts and the Capcom, but they could not break into the loop to say anything themselves. They could communicate on a separate loop with both the flight director who sat at the console in the third row of mission control and with one of several backroom support teams. These teams had consoles of their own with which they would track the flights and help their particular controller solve problems. The portion of the flight plan the controllers and crew were running was that period about 100 hours after launch when Lovell and Hayes would be down on the lunar surface inside the lunar module and Mattingly would be station keeping 60 miles above in the command module. It was a time like this in any lunar landing mission that the Electrical Environmental and Consumables Manager, also known as ECOM, would have a light workload because the mothership just didn't have much to do and because of the loss of signal that occurred every time it slipped behind the back of the moon. As long as the spacecraft was functioning smoothly when it disappeared, the 40-minute blackout every two hours gave you a chance to stretch a little, take your eyes off the screen, and plan for any upcoming maneuvers. As one of today's simulated blackouts began, Liebergott was checking his screen when he noticed something funny. A barely perceptible drop-off in the cabin pressure reading. This flutter, no more than a bump in the pounds per square inch data, was visible for barely a second before the ship vanished behind the moon, annihilating the readings entirely. 
Liebergott and his backroom team were on the air to each other instantly. Did you see that cabin pressure? The backroom asked. Saw it, said Liebergott. How much did it go down? About a tenth of a PSI, no more. Not much, the backroom said. What do you think? It's probably nothing, Liebergott answered. Ratty data, I'm sure. Right before loss of signal, what else could it be? So, Liebergott and his backroom team relaxed, confident that ratty data was the right explanation. In an authentic flight, ratty data would have been the right explanation. But in this simulated flight, the SIM supervisor had decided that ratty data would be the wrong explanation. For 40 minutes of blackout, Liebergott and his support team did nothing about the oxygen anomaly, convinced that what they had seen was merely a harmless illusion. Then the ship came out of blackout, and Ken Maddenley's voice called out across the simulated void. We had a sudden depressurization here, Houston, he said. Cabin pressure is down to zero, and at this moment, I'm on suit pressure. I'm guessing there's a leak in the bulkhead, but I don't know. Liebergott went cold. The blip in the pressure had been real. This was a test aimed squarely at E.E.C.O.M., and he had failed it. Lovell, Mattingly, and Hayes had not been in on the game. Mattingly had been suddenly thrown the problem, not in the form of a real pressure loss in the simulator, of course, but in the form of a cabin pressure needle plummeting to zero. And he did the only thing he could do, put on his suit, button it up, and wait for the reacquisition of signal. Only Liebregat and his back room had been given any warning, and they had done precisely nothing. Liebregat waited for a response on the communications loop from the flight director. Now, if the flight director had been Chris Kraft, the man who oversaw mission control through Mercury and Gemini, Liebregat figured he would be finished. Kraft didn't put up with big mistakes. You lose a ship, even a phony ship. You just might lose your job. But in this case, Liebergott hadn't actually lost the ship, but he had lost something almost as valuable. Forty minutes in which he and his back room could have come up with solutions to the catastrophe that the signal had warned them about. Fortunately for Liebergott, Chris Kraft had left the flight director's job some time ago, moving upstairs into NASA management. In his place was Gene Krantz. To the men in the room, Krantz was still a bit of an enigma. Running mission control from his consecrated console, he seemed every bit the military man he had once been. His instructions were terse and always clear. His tone rarely brooked any nonsense. The one non-regulation indulgence he allowed himself concerned his clothes. During lunar flights that could run on for days and even weeks, four rotating teams of console crews would work in mission control, each one headed by a different flight director. The teams were designated by color and Krantz's had been dubbed the White Team. The lead flight director took a competitive pride in the talents of his crew and during flights had lately made it a point to wear a white vest over his regulation white shirt and black tie as a sort of unabashed team emblem. The vest made Krantz seem more approachable, if not lovable, and the controllers who worked for him enjoyed their boss's one mild eccentricity. Today was just a simulation day, however, and Krantz's vest was nowhere in sight, even if it had been. Liebergott suspected it would hold no protective magic. The entire control room heard Maddenly radio down his problem. The entire control room heard the Capcom radio back a Roger. And the entire control room waited to hear how Krantz would respond.
All right, the flight director said after a seemingly endless pause. Let's work the problem. Liebergott let out a breath. This, he knew, was Krantz speak for I'm sparing your behind. And he fell to work at his console with a gusto that was equal parts relief and gratitude. But salvaging the simulated mission was not an easy matter. Liebergott and the other controllers decided to try out a little practiced survival plan in which the lunar module would blast off for an immediate docking with the mothership and then remain attached to it, serving as a kind of lifeboat into which the astronauts could crowd themselves until approaching Earth. When they would crawl back into the command module, jettison the lunar module and re-enter the atmosphere. The lifeboat idea had been kicking around since the early days of the Apollo program in 1964, and a few such maneuvers had even been practiced in early 1969 when the Apollo 9 astronauts flew the first lunar module in Earth orbit. However, nobody seriously believed it would ever have to be used. Krantz let the lifeboat exercise run for a few hours, until he was convinced that the controllers and astronauts had learned the survival protocols, and not incidentally that Liebergott had learned a lesson. Finally, though, they aborted the sim and went on to another, less fanciful one. This, of course, made sense. Only a few weeks remained before the launch, and there were plenty of scenarios to rehearse that were a lot more likely to occur than a dead command module and a lifeboat lunar module. Salutations from the foothills of North Carolina. This is Michael Annis, your host, and I wanted to say thanks for listening to episode 258 of the Space Rocket History Podcast entitled Apollo 13 Introduction Part 1. Hope you enjoyed this episode. It was a pleasure to bring it to you. I would like to give a big shout out to all my longtime listeners. Thanks for staying subscribed and extend a warm welcome to my new listeners. I'm glad you're here. A couple of weeks ago, I added some more episodes to the Archive podcast, and we now have episodes 1 through 71 available on iTunes, Google Play, and all your favorite podcatchers. Just look for the Space Rocket History Archive. Now, I will try to get some more up next month, July, with the goal of catching up with the main podcast RSS feed. But if you just can't wait until that occurs... Keep in mind, all of the episodes are available on the homepage, spacerockethistory.com. Today, we salute the Gemini-level donors. There are 12 so far this year. Gemini donors contribute $40 or more during the calendar year. Thank you for your continued support, Gemini donors. Okay, I had several afterthoughts about this week's episode. First of all, I want to credit my sources. A Man on the Moon by Andrew Chaikin. Failure is Not an Option by Gene Krantz. Flight by Chris Craft. Two Sides of the Moon by David Scott and Alexei Leonov. And Lost Moon by Jim Lovell. Since this was such an intensely serious mission, I thought I would start this episode with a little bit of fun. Hence the Mission Control Party Story and the DSM Awards. I hope you found that amusing. It was kind of sad to see more of NASA's budget was being cut, which led to the cancellation of Apollo 20, and it will lead eventually to Apollo 18 and 19. Pretty sad. It was strange for me to think that after all the work Director Gilruth did, He still wanted to end the moon missions after Apollo 12. I guess it was crew safety that was his prime concern. 
But the nation had geared up, and there was production in the pipeline already. I think we really needed to fly those final missions. After all, the United States might not return to the moon for another 50 years after Apollo. So the opportunity we had now, with the hardware there in the pipe, we really needed to go ahead and take the opportunity to proceed with those Apollo missions. That's just what I thought. Well, it's a good thing. They practice all those scenarios in mission control. The SIM supervisor really picked out a good one for this mission. Kind of reminded me of the mission control simulation for the 1201 and 1202 alarms that they practiced back on Apollo 11. So once again, my hat's off to SimSup for doing such a good job. Okay, I have posted some pictures and the audio for this episode on my homepage, spacerockethistory.com. Hope you check that out. I was very pleased to receive eight donations to support the podcast over the past week. Bruce M. from Seattle, Washington donated at the Orion level and earned his rocket emoji. Anthony G. from the U.K. donated at the Apollo level. Jose M. donated at the Apollo level. Zachary M. from Australia donated at the Apollo level and earned his rocket emoji. Andrew R. sent in another donation this year, moving him to the shuttle level with rocket and moon emojis. Ray R. donated at the Gemini level. Adrian S. pledged on Patreon at the Vostok level and earned his rocket emoji. And Elaine D. pledged on Patreon at the Vostok level. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Our Patreon donors are at 173, with a goal of reaching 218 for 2018. And our overall donors for 2018 have reached 276. For those of you who are enjoying the content provided here and have not donated yet in 2018, please consider supporting the podcast if you are financially able. Keep in mind, Space Rocket History is entirely listener-funded. I depend upon your financial support to keep the podcast going. To support the podcast, go to the homepage, spacerockethistory.com, and click on the orange Donate button or the Patreon link. All donors are rewarded with their name on the donors page at the level they choose to donate. Now, for those of you who have already donated for 2018, I certainly appreciate it. Once again, we have a surprise to give away this week. To select the winner, Mrs. SRH gave every 2018 donor a number, and then she put the range in Google's random number generator and got the number for Greg Gardner. That's Greg Gardner. If you would email me, mike at spacerockethistory.com, tell me your address, and I will mail this out to you. I was pleased to see the podcast received nine new five-star ratings on iTunes over the past few weeks. I wanted to thank Stuart96782 and Dane Unicorn and KA7FVV for the very kind review and five-star rating. And also, I want to thank the six other anonymous people who gave the podcast the all-important five-star rating. I also want to thank Stuart and Dane for the reviews, and five-star ratings on the Archive podcast. We also had three other people who gave the Archive a five-star rating anonymously, and I want to thank them for doing so. Okay, folks, that's all I have for this week. Hope to have episode 259 posted by next Thursday. So long for now.